Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Tiono, the last of Europe in which we're playing as everyone's favorite Guangdong state, the state of Guangdong. But for this route, I've done Sony, I've done Matsushita, I've done Fujitsu, uh, is that it? Have I done another one? I can't remember. But now it's time for the Hitachi run and to see what they are like. But the devil is in the details. You're kidding me. Ibuka Masu snapped away from his desk in an almost indistinctive disgust. The numbers that he'd spoken. Falcom's 222's, uh, 222's sales campaign was crumbling and he'd be lying if he claimed to not have anticipated any of this travesty. His suspicions arose when neither him, nor Rita, or Matsushita had received an iota of subsidy from Suzuki. Suzuki. Even with the product launched barely months away, now those suspicions turned into nightmarish reality, made manifest through blood, red numbers, and plummeting lines congregating upon his desk, taunting him for his falling helplessness. The culprit, Hitachi Limited, electronic subsidiary of the Nissan Zaibatsu based in Manchukuo, and previously an utter outsider of the Guangdong's battleground or capital, RDF's Hitak 201 computing machine was making dangerously large splashes in factories and department stores with capabilities rivaling that of the Falcom Triple Two. The only half of its price tag, Falcom 2222s. 222's market share was being nibbled away by the day, yet Ibuko was defenseless against it. Manufacturing virtually ground to a halt from insufficient funds, raising the stakes of price cuts above tolerable levels. Hitac 201 would therefore remain the cheaper choice for clues consumers to flock to. Typical. Ibuko was still convulsing with rage and disbelief when it hit him. Was it what Suzuki wanted? Fujitsu rendered nothing more than a sitting duck? Was it his refusal to subsidize the three companies, in fact, a sadistic display of power? A twisted warning against his misbegotten idea of disobedience? Suzuki's pompous face loomed over Ibuko's mind, so Ibuko gritted his teeth, turned back to his desk, and began leafing through the phone books. Like heck, he's gonna let that snake have his way. Two can play at that game, and he'll bring in whatever leverage he can secure. Even if it means striking a deal with the intruders, as long as they kept their hands off Guangdong's own affairs. Komai Kinichiro? Quite an affable person, from what I remember. Increased his monthly power efficiency based research. Enter the product cycle as Hitachi, and every product cycle will get access to a wide variety of decisions for quality and interest. The fourth electronics conglomerate of Kwangdong is a Nissan subsidiary of Hitachi, led by Komaki Nichiro. Their business strategy focuses on underselling its competition by selling highly power-efficient electronics, but we're going to go with Hitachi for this run, and our goal is to get as much influence with the Kenpai Tai here as possible, and hopefully it will reduce the corruption, but the goal is, of course, Hitachi! Hitak. 201 mainframe. There was nothing unusual in what the Hitachi computer was capable of. Under the watchful eye of the Manchurian constructors, insurance actuaries quickly picked up the basics of operating the new mainframe computers. Inputting data, sequencing operations, command syntax, storage hierarchies, and displaying outputs, the magnetic tape storage units were, despite the intimidating size of the entire machine, remarkably easy to remove in service if one was so inclined. Nobody. Disputed the power of Hitachi's creation, crunching insurance numbers was hard enough by hand, and every second saved by the Hitachi 201 was a second needed elsewhere, but some of the men had overheard the executive talking. Who needs a Fujitsu mainframe when Hitachi is willing to sell an equivalent device at half the cost? How is that possible? Material is unlikely. Given the quality, finishing, and capabilities of the device, Guangdong's lack of tariff rates. That only answered why the Hitachi 201 was more expensive than its contemporaries. It was the most unusual element of all, unless of course one thought of the labor costs, in which case there truly was nothing unusual about Hitachi's creation at all. Undercutting the competition, so we got one more Suzuki seat. Um, real growth, a little less than 2%, 4.5% GDP growth. Miscellaneous income is a little less than a billion, and we market it towards the Republic of China because in the end it won't really matter, probably. And I want to save the Japanese market for later when we're actually even more profitable, so we get some more Chinese support for now, but, uh, well, it probably won't really matter in the end, will it? Another year, another Hitachi success. The ST3500 television, the cutting edge sometimes is overrated. Putting the pinnacle of technology on a pedestal is often an exercise in rarefied elitism. The perennial hunt of Ibuka's sneering gaze, trying endlessly to create bigger and clearer screens for television viewing. What does that really do beyond creating an engineering arms race far beyond the reach of the average man? Neither, however, do people want to feel cheap. Pandering to the masses with plastic and cheap construction like Matsushita and Morita do, it's oftentimes an exercise in testing your customer's patience. <clears throat> They'll accept it so long as it's cheap, but if they had the means, you'll know they want something different. Enter the SG. 3500. It doesn't promise a revolution. Black and white television, after all, has been present for years, but it doesn't insult the taste of our customers. A tasteful finish of a polished wood paneling, with every dial tested for that a satisfied tactile click. And a picture of quality no worse than any of its competitors. And all at a price that cannot be beat. It actually promises a future where technology ceases to be extraordinary, or a cheap gimmick. It promises a lifestyle, the opiate of the masses. So we reach 100% interest and quality and at this point with this campaign, uh, since we're going to go with Hitachi and Komai Kenichiro eventually. We don't give a crap about the Chinese or the Zuzhin here, so like I just destroyed all the support I had from them. But we got some real growth, some good growth, miscellaneous income. And Japan loves us, the Chinese hate us, but 
Whatever. Another year, another Hitachi-made product. The KH920L transistor radio. In business, there are no mistakes. There are errors, mishaps, and flaws, but not mistakes, no. Mistakes imply a fundamental disturbance in the bigger picture, as it were, that their underlying plan wasn't what it should have been. Now, the KH920L isn't that. If one drowns out the half-whispered sneers in the background, Hitachi's new product shares with passing resemblances to Matsushita's design. Powered by 9 transistors, the KH920L isn't content with merely giving out sound, like a crumpled leaflet to a passerby and bellows, so even the half-deaf and elderly can help hear the crisp, clear quality from Hitachi's trademark design instead of devoting a portion of the front to the speakers. The speakers dominate the KHL, uh, KH920L. Percentage to surface-wise, a few others can match Hitachi's immensity, perfect for any noise, any sound, or any frequency that may come their way. When these features are all put together, it would be a mistake to say that Hitachi copied Matsushita's vision. Matsushita's vision is some fleeting glimpse into the future, but Hitachi, we are the future. We've got 100% interest and quality, and also we are going down Akeo's path to get to the <clears throat> eventual Hitachi path. The RA-189 air conditioner. The executive circled the device, inspecting every contour. Work? If Hitachi had settled for simply working, then they would have been shut down in their infancy. The RA-189 needed to dominate. Matsushita's time in the sun was coming soon. They knew it. Hitachi knew it. Every, even the partisan in northwestern Manchukuo knew it. The question is, when the sun's rays fade and the entire market falls under the shadows of speculation, what eclipses it? This is definitely cold, sir. The rate of temperature decrease is exactly to your liking. As if to prove himself right, the assistant put his hands over the grill before quickly recoiling and limply shaking it. Everything about Matsushita's design was put into theirs, except better. Better because they had learned from the mistakes of their adversaries. Where switches and lights were needed to have any sort of control over the settings, Hitachi had replaced it with a simple control dial. Where minutes, if not hours, were used to up just to control the temperature of the room, Hitachi made sure it take make sure it took seconds. Where customers were thinking of replacing the conditioners with newer, smarter devices, Hitachi would be there to greet them with open arms. Yes, Matsushita may be king, but every king must die sometime. This time, we marketed to the kingdom of Italy and got some really good growth and increases our own seats by three. Wow. For your protection. What is the meaning of this? Morita Keo tried to fight off his bodyguards, attempting to hurry the men into his armored convoy outside the towering complex of the building. The silence of the sleepy Koshu evening was but a distant memory. Sirens of all pitches and volumes attempted to undercut the other with utter urgency as every emergency service in the nation converged onto the city. Chief Executive, there's been reports of the guard was cut off almost on cue as a bloom of orange white shot out from the nearby streets, shattering every window in sight. Another explosion sounded up behind them, sending debris into the air. The ears still ringing, Morita Akeo pushed past a crowd of staff towards his vehicle, closely flanked by a security detail. Hitachi had made their move. Morita Akeo clenched his fist, turning his knuckles near white. This could have been stopped. Nipped in the bud, but it wasn't. So be it. But as the chief executive finally reached his car and got in the back seat, another noise cut through the air. Not of gunfire or of a deafening boom, but the screeching of tires. Two long trucks screeched to a halt, blocking the roads into the city, pouring out of their back. An endless convoy of soldiers approached the car, unabated by the bodyguards aimed at the weapons of the men. Chief executive! Orders have come from Tokyo. Your personnel are to surrender your weapons. You will come with us, one of the men closest to the car. Despite the gloom of the night, the orange glow bathed the eyes of the soldier, their strange tranquility betraying the mock worry in his voice. What is going on here? I'm the chief executive. For God's sakes. Chief executive, come with us. You have some papers to sign, and this city is going to survive the night. And which, at this time, we have enough political power, which because I've not been doing very much with it. Um... The Legislative Council holds its breath. We have three days left. Hitachi has the tools, manpower, and political capital to enforce their vision onto Guangdong. If we want to stop them, we need to stop them now. But it is already too late. Thank God. And in the meantime, we're just going to keep doing this too, because we need to get this done, the PTRG stuff. Checkpoint Central. Uh, the events of last night have brought Guangdong to its core, and what local police alongside Camp Pata units are calling a... The death toll has been not yet been calculated yet, but as you can see, bodies have been found in the wreckage. A grim sight to be... The whereabouts of the chief executive are still currently unknown. But the Camp Atai spokesperson has uh, confirmed his safety and that he is currently residing in a trapped secret location outside of the city. And we dearly hope that our brother nation destroys the pestilence of terrorism that currently plagues it. We too were liberated by the Japanese forces in 1932. From the banditry and warlordism that still afflicts much of the world, let me assure you what Japan did for Manchuria, we're more than happy to do for Guangdong. The broadcast cut out. That's it the power for the entire apartment. Chun reclined back into his bed, staring blankly past the bars that crisscrossed the dirty stained window. There was nothing left to think about. Chun feebly attempted to start a stream of consciousness going, but nothing ever came to him. Not an idea. Not a plan. Not a, even a reaction. The only thing that even approached him was to remind his sister not to go to school today. Not him, though. The station was understaffed and underpre underprepared. A flicker of life flashed before him. A ceiling flame creaking back to life. Then the TV uh, switched on. Chun shut his eyes and tried his best to drift to sleep. It'd be the last he would get for a very lo lo well long time. All across Guangdong, the newsmen and newswomen all just got the same memo from the superiors. Remain calm. Do not adjust your sets as we have a cup of coffee here. Where are we at with this? We have failed. And that's okay. 
We need more of this too, anyways. Under new management, get off me! Yasukawa Yoshiko barks, shrugging off a shoulder, attempting to prod her into a conference hall, finding her footing. Uh, oh. Oh, you know this place, go ahead. Um, she followed the rest of the journals into the large uh, carpeted enclosure. To her right, a floor to ceiling window overlooked the city. Sporadic columns of smoke still bloomed from random spots inside the metropolis. What was happening in Guangdong was not new. Someone, presumably someone backed by those either influential or desperate enough to take on the Guangdong elite, had just orchestrated the largest terrorist campaign in China since the end of the Second World War. Question was, who was pulling the strings? That's when he appeared. Of course, Komai Kenichiro stepped onto the podium, grinning and nodding to his audience. Enraptured by his very appearance, just as the flashes and questions became most intense, the room darkened and the news cameras flickered on. Now, the eyes of the world were on him. The events of the last few days have been a shock to us all. Madmen have decided to attack our fair state and spread unimaginable bloodshed across our nation, Kumai began, tightening his tie and giving a solemn stare to the cameras. In the time of great crisis, it appears that our last line of defense has failed. Despite his dedication and ushering a new age of prosperity and freedom, the chief executive has underestimated just how great the situation has become. Kumai continued, breaking eye contact with the cameras for maximum effect. It is to this then, the chief executive has enlisted the help of the Kenpai Tide and system destroying these bandits, but with a heavy heart, I must announce that the chief executive feels that he's no longer able to deal with the situation and has resigned. Goodbye, Kao. And I'm here to become a successor. Hitachi Ku in Guangdong! A strange development has been reported in the halls of power in the state of Guangdong, a semi autonomous company ruled dependency of the Japanese Empire. It appears that the chief executive has taken responsibility for the recent economic chaos in Guangdong and has resigned as a part of what seems to have been a lightning coup d'etat and been replaced by Chief Executive Officer Komai Kenichiro of Hitachi Corporation. With the support of the Manchurian Industrial Development Corporation, the state owned behemoth of Manchukuo, and the IJA's Kenpai Tai fanning out across the cities and townships of Guangdong, it appears that Hitachi's coup has completely supplanted the existing Guangdong corporate order. This is to our liking, but Chief Executive Komai. Indeed, Divine Destiny has favored Komai Kenichiro, airman, chairman of the Hitachi, the electric, electronics subsidiary of the Nissan Zaibatsu, as he has secured outstanding triumphs over rival elements in both the legislative council and the civilian sector, enabling his current residence in the Oval Office, in the office of the Chief Executive of Guangdong, and thus his dominance over the majority of the state's executive apparatus. Ever faithful adherents of Pan-Asianism, Chief Executive Komai and his loyal associates have expressed an open uh, wish to fundamentally restructure Guangdong's political, social, and economic systems along the lines of Manchukuo, the industrial powerhouse of the co-prosperity sphere, as well as Nissan's base of operations. Now possessing sufficient executive power to realize his noble ideals, our chief executive shall sponsor the consolidation of Nissan's status as a profitable and formidable economic entity across the season. Above all, the reinstatement of Guangdong is an exemplar of prosperity and jewel of the South truly deserving of its name. Certain mistakes must be amended if we are to proceed, however. The pacification of Guangdong has begun. Our approach to policing will evolve into pervasive Kenpai Tai networks. And uh, Kenpai Tai networks, well, we'll talk about that. Ooh, use Kenpai Tai. The system of the corruption that permeates Guangdong is rotting away in its structure. Chief Executive Komai and his connections to the Kenpai Tai shall strike fear to any who are caught dealing in illicit activities to secure a prosperous future for the state of Guangdong. Beautiful. Yeah, corruption is actually very high, which sucks. Um, Regions of Guangdong completely dominated, uh, which is good. Chinese hate us. Zuzhi don't like us. Uh, expats are fine with us. Look at this happy, smiley man. The Manchurian executive. Nothing bad can go happen with him, right? Exactly. The Emergency Regulations Ordinance. We are in grave danger. The state of Guangdong, as it currently stands, is confronted by an immediate threat poised to hinder its progress and compromise its very foundations as existence. And the root of such a malady we have discovered is Guangdong's long-standing instabi internal instability stemming from its discordant and self-cannibalizing governing institutions. Drastic complications require equally drastic countermeasures which can only sufficiently centralized governing body can deliver. Through the rationale, a rational and persuasive words of our chief executive and the other representatives have begun to see reason in the emergency regulations ordinance, which is expected to receive unanimous approval of the legislative council. What's the purpose? The reallocation of all remaining executive power to our chief executive and his loyal subordinates, thus permitting swift and decisive elimination of Guangdong's existential threat and safeguarding its future for years to come. Only then we can begin the work on our grand design. And we have a cup of coffee to keep us nice warm too, but darkness. Oh, this, you shall know, compliance is the easy way out. By integrating the Kenpai Tai into part of our security strategy, we'll no longer gain corruption from the Kenpai Tai controlled states. Oh, we're so close to having it. Darkness, and the halls of the Legislative Council are empty now. There are men inside, and in another time would be Legislative Councillors. Those hallowed few who dictated the destiny of millions for all their own good, but now they're just men. Powerless, nameless, and voiceless. There's a pair of men who, maybe long ago, were bitter rivals in the Council, endlessly jockeying for power and wealth from whatever corporate overlord will sponsor them. They attempt to whisper under hushed tones, but years of arrogance, callousness, or maybe disbelief fond of what has happened to their island of stability and prosperity in southern China betrays them. In a few days, a colleague of our staff member, maybe even each other in some pathetic attempt to adapt, will feed Hitachi tales of the insolence. In a few days, both men will disappear and be replaced by another pair of perfectly average bureaucrats. Outside. The city is darkened by the dazzling golden neon of the newly placed Hitachi signs. Contem contemplated. 
uh, complemented, and it's part by the spiraling vanguard of the spotlights that comb over the city. Previously, only a handful of men would have ever been aware of Koma Kenichiro's existence, yet as another industrial tycoon in a sea of many. There's not a man in the entire country who does not know his name now. Men try to live their lives, attempting to spark idle chatter with their friends and family, now keenly aware of how to fickle their future as to those who now are really in charge. Women try to assure their children that nothing has changed, it's only their only weapon against a dread that has rained, but it is a candlelit flame against a typhoon. Well, the sun is set over Guangdong, what it shall rise over once more will be nothing like the world has ever seen before. It is finished. And we're doing okay. Are you learning? No, then you're wrong. It's doing the best it can, though. I just don't know good enough. But happy November, everybody, in 1966. To boot. Oh, wow, they actually won. Look at that. Go figure. Uh, I guess moving to Chief Executive Komai. Welcome aboard, my friends. Ooh, we can bribe a seat. We will need at least one seat. Oh, no, we don't. We have 50. So if we do this, it increases our seats by 5. Economy will become more centralized by 10. Slash all assorted laws that do not benefit and tax reign. Nice. Hey, what's, what's, what's not to love? Boots on the ground. Kenpai Tai, our star wall shield, and our merciless sword. More stability. Everyone's stake is more Kenpai Tai and increased Chinese government support. At the foot of profit. There's only one thing that matters. Itachi's glory, and the glory alone. The copper crown on her brow. Nissan rise in Hong Kong. Teeth and hate. Boots on the ground. Guangdong is akin to a gleaming pearl, prosperous and exquisite. Yet it is fragile and friable, with the possibility of its beauty crumbling to dust under the malevolent boot of the, dis of the dissidents. Lurking and present in every minute crevice. The copious amounts of unenlightened individuals who oppose the status of law and order threaten the grand design of the chief executive and are in cholate administration, and on the present sinister specter looming over the state. To effectively demonstrate the futility of opposition, their presence shall be met with the fire and steel of our esteemed security forces that are assisting the dutiful Kent by on the ground. No single person, young or elderly, male or female, shall escape reprisal for dissent. The security and welfare of Guangdong be guaranteed under any and all circumstances. Exceptions are non-existent. May the principal residents of the rural Pearl River Delta rejoice under watchful guardianship. On the emergency regulations ordinance, come on, can it was a train wreck? Kane decided he had only gotten into power on technicalities, lies, and deceit, and his tenure in so far only made that clap fact clear. It was all he could do to not turn away, to block his ears with both of his shoulders. How could a man be made so hypocritical? The emergency regulations ordinance will cut down on the fat and unwanted baggage of Guangdong. Easy, uninterrupted growth makes a society weak. It makes a society unruly, an unshackled beast that can move in any direction at once, from the degeneracy to any number of evil and tolerable beliefs. We have allowed this joke to go on far too long. None shall laugh at a new society, one that we shall craft. Discipline, re-education, self-reliance. Only these things will purge the tumors that curse our nation. Only these things will simmer our republic down into an animal that can survive these tremulous years. I say it again, only this ordinance can do such things. I have an elongated 20-minute speech. The Legislative Council is adjourned until the next day. King had moved from seat, however. He watched Kamai descend the steps, all smiles and handshakes. He felt like a punch to the gut when he saw his colleagues congratulating him. The emergency ordinance was a little more than a cover for Kamai to seize dictatorial-like power. How can they not see that? How long will this mask continue? And the wielder of Imperium. I'll be about 1946 Part 2. Please go ahead, Ben. I should be... Yeah, we should, I think I read this before. The vast chamber of the Legislative Council, a space of debate and uproar, of arguments and rebuttals, of speeches and cheers. Today, however, the raucous and discordant room is all united in silence, the attendance being rather sparse compared to the usual meetings. A man stood atop the rostrum, shuffling a series of papers behind the le wooden lectern, upon which a symbol of the council is engraved. The Pacific atmosphere is broken by the thunderous voice of the speaker announcing the triumph of Komai Kenichiro, the cadence of his sentences bellowed throughout the room, giving the implication of drastic importance of the message being delivered. Komai himself confidently rose from his seat. An urbane smile resting upon his lips, a brilliant golden light illuminated his face, a radiant diadem of triumph. The applause of Hitachi representatives was a harmonious symphony produced by a graceful and refined orchestra, the notes carrying him closer towards ascendancy. He climbed the steps onto the platform, gently waving towards the representatives of the council and neglecting the sullen appearances of certain men who represent companies like Sony and Hong Kong. They'd be gone away soon anyway, merely obstacles to his grand design. The speaker stepped aside with humility, lending his position to the newly minted chief executive. The tune of jubilation and ecstasy fell silent once more, soon replaced by the soft voice of Komai himself, addressing his subordinates. My friends, my compatriots, my citizens. With the beginning of my administration, Guangdong shall undoubtedly enter into an era of never-before-seen prosperity. An era of growth and progress, I will bring to Guangdong valor, piety to the state, clemency and justice. The emphatic orchestra began once anew, began once again, and a new administration is christened with a cheer and ovation. Oderant dom mit metunt. And we get reverberations. Of course we're going to purge corrupt officials. What are you talking about? 
intimidating about Sushi. The day was almost ending, so Kamal Kenichiro reached over the table and grabbed another cigarette. He placed it between his fingers, feeling the rough paper on his fingertips, took a puff quickly, and then dragged it away since there was so much important work to be done, of course. The thought before him, or his mind, was the upcoming vote on the emergency regulations ordinance in the Lego, specifically how to ensure a safe passage to the chamber. Kamal considered the matter of Matsushita's legislators. On the one hand, a significant number of them had already promised to support Hitachi's ordinance in the Lego. On the other hand, many of them still remained firmly opposed. Petulant in the face of Kumai's vision, that would not do, he thought. In fact, decadent. If fact decadent and defiant, Guangdong was to survive, this ordinance must pass. How could else could he discipline this unruly child? How else was the Republic to be brought back to order? It was a time for persuasion. For argument, this was not the time, though. Uh, if Masashi's men to understand, Kumai thought a few prods in the right direction would, would help them do so. A few Hitachi men to their houses, some like blackmail, maybe a note outlining the rather serious consequences of their opposition. The chief executive thought of how to best handle the situation, carving out a plan in his mind. We're fine. We don't need him. Reverberations. The move within the Lenko was both excited and apprehensive. Komai can show was an unknown factor in the council for the most part. It sends shockwaves across the nation when he was appointed to become its newest chief executive. His first hearing in the council chambers was sure to be an historic event. <clears throat> As Representative Kane sat down to listen to the man's first speech, he was completely surprised by the unentertaining drudgery of it. I have been given a mandate by the people of Guangdong. The Zhujin and us few loyal Japanese servants, I thank you all for it, and promise you that this republic shall reach new heights under my leadership. In such a way, the Cantonese has always been part of been of trade, entrepreneurship, and commerce, and I will not leave this play, or our office while tapping into this ancient tradition. I can promise you that. It was perfect at saying everything that said nothing. Kane reflected, tapping into ancient customs that have been done by the ancients and will no longer serve this modern nation, you despise these abstract concepts such as trade and entrepreneurship. Kane decided that he liked this executive less than the last one. Still, it would not make the enemies like this early into his tenure. Kane clapped with clapped the rest of them, regretting every time he left his left hand, uh, regretting every time his left hand hit his right. Anywhere it begins. Where is the... Are there rivers around here? Uh, it's, it's desert. Savannah. It's probably really hot. But it's gotta be jungle, so I don't really care. Well, battle plan's gonna work. Forcing a Fujitsu. Come on, Kenichiro. I'll spend a few moments at this desk gnawing over the question. What was wrong with those so-called legislators? If the it was true that he didn't have high expectations for them in the first place, but he still found himself disappointed. The issue was, of course, emergency regulations ordinance, specifically the reluctance to approve the proposed law. Kamaya had already written off Marita's men as a lost cause, and he knew that Masashida was keen on preserving any kind of shared power he had. He had, some for, he had some hope for Ibuka's men. Of all the different unruly groups in the Legislative Council, Kamaya thought that Fujitsu's legislators would be the most rational and logical of all people. Surely they understood just how uncompetitive Guangdong has become, how necessary these measures were to save it from its destruction. Or so he thought. In the end, it turned out just as useless as the others. While some of the legislators saw a reason, far too many did not. Well, come on, I thought. Well, there was always other ways to get them to see. A few Hitachi men of their houses, some black blackmail, maybe out, no, outlining the rather serious consequences of their opposition. Uh, the chief executive thought how to best handle the situation, carving out a plan in his mind. There is one before. Oh, well, not bad. Ah, I have the Americans down here, though. Uh, come down here. I better do something else. Squeezing Sony, come on, get a churro. Uh, took, a, took a cigarette, placed it in his mouth, and breathed out, trying to his, get his mind off things for a little bit. He knew that Morita, Kao, and his men were radicals, of course. Their plans would collapse Guang down if they came to fruition. Support from them was always going to be unlikely, but uh, complete a unanimous opposition. The chief executive wondered whether they were saboteurs or just foolish. There was, of course, <clears throat> of the upcoming vote on the emergency council, uh, regulations, ordinance, I should say. One by one, as if uh, like automatons. Uh, every single legislator linked to a chaos and Sony declared that they would vote against the government. Come on, consider the irony inherent in this situation. These were the people who called themselves reformists, who apparently saw the need to change, or need for change in Guangdong. Did they not see then how diseased this place was with their own two eyes? Could they not smell its rotting putrid flesh with their own fat noses? Did they not understand then that in order for Guangdong to thrive or even merely survive, that these measures were necessary? What reformers they were, so believe the evidence still in front of their own eyes. I uh, saw they could be corrupted in voting the right way, just like the others would. So. Don't eat them. I love coffee. Probably honestly too much. Hey, there we go. That pretty good. Nice. Keep it going. Keep it going. Molasses. The outraged shouts and jeers of the Legislative Council. Uh, members followed Kamai as he left the chambers and returned to his office. As his car pulled out of the building, Kamai was already on the phone to uh, staff back at Corporate HQ, telling the poll of files they had on every member of the council. By the time he got back to his desk, it was groaning into this unsteady heap of files and correspondence. A lesser mind would have paled at the prospect of sorting through this, but Kumai hadn't gotten anywhere he was out. He was today out of aversion to hard work. The council had predictably gone up in flames over the emergency regulations ordinance. Kumai recognized that asking the council to officially recognize a coup against its authority was a tall order, and nonetheless it had to be done. 
While arms had delivered him to power, he could not afford to hold the council in total contempt. He needed their stamp as much as it irked him. So he sorted through the files, noting down which representatives could be bribed, which could be blackmailed, which could be threatened. As the sun went down, the crackets began their nightly song. Kamaya had a semblance of a plan, and a blank check from among Yo the wish to pull it off. A tad of money washes away the uh, opposition. Forget anonymous wire transfers. Clandestine efforts to force the passage of the ordinance are conducted. She'll buy as many let go votes as we need for the comfortable majority at the expense of considerable corruption and cost. We don't need it. We're, we're clean, man. What are you talking about? We are clean. Did we get it done? Nice. We need a battle plan now. Hey, advancements in power efficiency technology. Sign us up. Let go of member finances. Yeah, we can do that, why not? Your new overlord, complete out of control over policy. The total subordination of the administration of Hitachi. Supreme executive power vested in the new chief executive, Komaki Nichiro. As the text of the new, now successful emergency regulation ordinance was read out slowly, word by word, reality began to sink in for the members of the legislative council. The atmosphere in the hall was tense. The legislators shot nervous glances at each other, frantically trying to figure out who among them might have sold out to, to, to Hitachi and why. How large were the bribes? How high was the pressure? What particularly brave soul stood up suddenly interrupting the reading of the ordinance? His voice clear and strong in the otherwise silent hall? No. We can't let this happen. This vote was taken unfairly. I know at least five people who were harassed by those Hitachi thugs. Please, we need to take another vote. Come on, nodded the Kempai Tai soldiers stationed at the, the doors of the chamber who quickly readied their batons at the council. The rebellious legislators slid back into a seat, defeated, and the chamber returned to silence once again. The chief executive himself observed the proceedings from above. He could see the three of them, Masashida, Morita, and Mibuka, all staring defiantly back at him, surprisingly united in that moment. It was it was clear that they weren't pleased, but ultimately their childish pouting didn't matter. I thought you know the undisputed master Guang Gong. As we should be. I said the activists get more stability what to do, like. Ooh, fingers in your throats. Do not complain, do not protest. Increase the size by two. Well, I said the activists. Well, there are threats and hazards of Guangdong surface repressed and kept in check. A new menace has emerged in the decrepit underground societies of the state. A new species of dissidents. A group of people who rally against a business practice that composes the foundation of Guangdong's core apparatus. A group of people who lambast their illustrious administration with unjustified criticism, openly decrying our chief executive and his wise policies. These people will be treated akin to any other dissidents at threat. will silence their voices and interrupt their sessions, ensuring that their presence is limited to nothing more than a whimper, greatly reducing their influence upon the public consciousness. As with any other dissidents, force will be applied if necessary if any opposition, open opposition is offered. The security force will not be restrained. The populace of Guangdong must come to realize the futility of intransigence. There's only one there. There goes the battle plan. Economic check is coming soon too. Nice. Honestly, we don't need probably even need to do that. Diesel electric train buffs. Yeah, do that. I don't really care. Ah, oh, you're so close. Are we done? We're done. Beautiful. Happy January 1967, everybody. Hey, if you want to read about this one, please go ahead. Life's back to normal. Oh, we got two more Sony seats. Wait, what? I was playing a Sony, but still. Um, 95%. That's okay to do. Nice. That's maxed out. Great. We needed what? 30... Oh, wow. Region Guangdong looking pretty good. Boots on the ground, adapt to survive. On the way to work, Li Chun counted the number of camp attack checkpoints on his right hand, which he made sure to keep hidden from the sight. Before he was even halfway through, he'd already had counted on his left. There was certainly a larger military presence than uh, <clears throat> he'd expected. Their olive uniforms were on seemingly every block, their boots a constant thumping whose sound reverberated through every city. At least he was much better dodging those checkpoints than before he needed to be, since even the tiniest unnatural twitch, the smallest prestige flight, the faintest hint of disobedience towards the Japanese. All this result in the offender being dragged arm first in the nearest camp I type vehicle for what the officers would not only refer to as questioning. Absolute lies, Chun thought. Those poor souls emerged from those long hours, hours long sessions, cowed, bruised, and littered over their skin. This had to be avoided at all costs, but there was also a collective agreement across Guangdong that they had to put up with all this, difficult as it may be. After all, what else could they do? Work still needed to be done, families are still need to be fed, the most basic human instinct survival still existed, and this was what was keeping them all going. 
No, there's no pleasure in any of it. In fact, there was really nothing there. Only a vague, vain hope that somehow maybe things would get couldn't get worse. They clung onto that thin flimsiness, since it was the only thing they could get through these days. But Chen knew that that was just a dream, and no one, and one unlikely to be realized. The foot of profit, corporate sanitation. Final control. How do species? Huh. Executive speech. Ooh. Teeth and hate. A cop copper crown on her brow. Because no measure too extreme in the face of disobedience. Teeth and hate. This is more radical, it sounds like. Because no measure too extreme in the face of disobedience. It is a campfire tie swift mobilization as well as outstanding surveillance and military capabilities that has earned its place as a sentinel of pan Asianism ever since the outbreak of this great East Asia war. A most honorable and title to which the passage of time has only let more credence. Should our local security presence appear overwhelmed by the recent dissident activity surge, we have no reason to refrain, refrain from summoning campfire tie reinforcements from all of the corners of the sphere and employ their anti insurgent expertise to their fullest. Absolutely. So now corruption is going up by just a little bit, just by a little bit every month. Which I don't understand why. You get more monthly support. See? See? Everyone loves us. Uh, of course, we do have uh, Camp here, but. Finance money can buy, which kind of sucks. Pervasive Camp Pai but whatever. It's their own re reunion. Um, suspended upon the black drop of the Caligonous night sky was a serene moon. Its ethereal form and lucent beams of bri brilliant silver light dangling above people thousands of, of miles apart. And its luster seemingly refreshed by the coming of a new year, exuberantly celebrated by people across Asia. The moon observed the reunion of families, the ebullient and vivacious celebrations filled with euphoria. Yet despite the same moon towering above the workhouses and factories of Guangdong, the merely atmosphere was noticeably absent. Yang Lok Chi sat in his subsidized apartment in front of a desk, upon which resided an empty piece of paper intended to be a letter to his mother explaining his absence during the Chinese New Year. He had just finished another tiring shift as his place of employment. A monster sheet of factory dedicated to producing consumer electronics, his work hours increased due to the ele elevated demand of the New Year's period. Thoughts raced through his mind as he contemplated justifications and explanations for not being beside the person that had raised him, that had fed and nurtured him, that had recited to him pieces of elk of poultry when he was young. He put his pen to the paper and began writing. Words appeared describing his struggles and experiences, the sacrifices he had to make to sustain his family, and his everlasting gratitude for his mother. Yang stopped for a short interval of time and deliberated once more. He had wanted a promise to be there next year, but in his mind, it was clear that he simply could not afford to. The wages he would be missing would be too detrimental. At this, he could only sigh. He peered out of the small round window beside towards the elegant moon in the night sky. His mind jumped to a line from an old poem his mother had once recited to him, a line that could come from both himself and his mother. Uh, though thousands of miles apart, we are still able to share this beauty of the same moon together. I wish you the best of health. Yang Lok Chi. Ah, but money. Ar, 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 ar. Look at Gorky go. Gorky's a big boy in this one. Who's in Germany? I didn't even check. Uh, oh, bald guy. Bowman. Papa B. 123. Not bad. Regions, as we saw, pretty good. Um, yeah, overall, not bad. I'll get some more approval soon. Uh, actually, we'll probably burn a little bit of it. Do that, uh, do that, and then this one. Liquid reserves is okay. We can do this one and what is that one? Corruption is getting a little lower. Not by much. But every little part helps. The bystander, huh? I really want to do this one just for the tiny bit more stability we get from this. Teeth and hate. Taking, talking to a brick wall. It wasn't always that Kama I can assure actually had a reason to uh, uh, to talk to the attaché rather than the consul general. Often his meetings where the other man were born of accident and disappointment. The product of the consul general's busy schedule and the delight which the chief executive swore his counterpart took in torpedoing his plans. We came down to police and military matters though there is no alternative but to head of this rather barren office of Wang Jingju. Really, really wish that wasn't the case. Um. I think it was one before. Well, maybe not. Re reading, reading these terms, Chief Executive, leads me to once again mention how lackluster the efforts of the Guangdong Police Force have been gathering intelligence. Our agents in the Camp Pai Tai constantly outstrip their work. Your policemen get in the way far more often than they help. That's an unfair attack on my kind of steeping, uh, steepling his hands in an effort to keep them from clenching the fists. The police are doing their best to maintain order in some of the fastest growing cities on the continent, without adequate help from either the Camp Pai Tai yourself. I'd have a mind to commend them for even maintaining order in such a state. Tetsuya Scott, he explained then how my work mostly consists of cleaning up after your officers. They remain unmoving in a seat, fixing Komai can ensure the cold glare. China will continue to cooperate with your policemen, regardless of their mistakes. Our meeting time is up. A bemused stare in return changed nothing. Finally, the chief executive stood, allowing himself a shake of his head as he's exited. How rude. 
Some days, Lamb's job was easier than others. Contrary to the action-packed, journal-filled depiction seen on TVs and others, life as an officer was mostly fairly dull. Most days, he could simply slip the role, take on the duty, and do his job to the highest possible standards. Supposed to be one of those days, along with a few other officers, he was assigned to be security for one of Camp Tide's regular raids. While the military police were shouting orders to each other in the office, his job was to just stand guard outside the building. Sooner or later, they didn't stop. The raid was over, Lamb surmised. He didn't have to wait long for the military police to return. When they did, they returned in groups, two or three of them, uh, each dragging a man to the waiting vans on the streets. These were respectable looking men, at least they once were. Their suits were all torn, patches of cloth ripped out in clumps. Many lost their jackets, and small blotches of blood were visible through their crumpled shirts. Almost everyone had lost at least one item of clothing, whether they were missing a shoe, a tie, the last man. An older one without his glasses struggled more than Moe's, and it took five officers to finally subdue him. While held down, the old man squinted his gaze locked with the lambs. On instinct, he took a couple of steps back. A camp by time man shouted out, Officer, Hayashi, stay focused. Yes, of course. He needed to stay still to do his duty, but it was impossible to ignore the anger and revulsion present in every fiber of that old man's face. No, on the faces of all those businessmen. The anger was palpable, visceral, leaping and clawing its way until a single message was engraved deeply into his brain. Officer Hayashi was a running dog of an evil machine. Actually, we get quite a bit of political power. Yeah, that's a lot. Executive speech. We inaugurate a new age of order, productivity, and progress, and we will brook no opposition. As natural that distance bears dissonance, mass swarms of dissidents have rallied against our consolidation of power. Regrettably, few among them where the chief executive is, in reality, a paragon of untainted benevolence. It is precisely only the benevolence that he has elected to establishing his administration among the untamed, disorderly banks and factories of Guangdong, wishing nothing more than a return to semblance of stability and prosperity to this patch of once fertile soil. To dissipate, uh, such a detrimental misconception circulating within our society, our chief executive has found it apt to prepare a direct address to the citizenry slated for a nationwide broadcast across all television and radio channels. With the most sincerity, we will inform them of our virtuous guardianship over all aspects of domestic affairs, ensure them that order and harmony will be duly and rightfully restored to their livelihood. What else can they do but rejoice? But we're clocking in early. Nintendo's offices lay mostly bare in the early hours of the morning. The normal day shift had yet to start for the privileged office workers, and most of the rooms and corridors lay empty. In his office, Yamauchi sat hard at work, however, peering over documents and annotating them in her handwriting. A comp compulsive and dedicated worker, Yamauchi never missed a chance to get an early start at admin. It had benefited leaving more time in the workday for real innovation. As he worked silently, he glanced at the clock and saw that the workday was just beginning. What immediately struck him was the silence. Sitting up, Yamauchi listened out for normal signs of the life that signaled 9 a.m. There was nothing, not even the sounds of foot traffic outside. Standing up, he approached the blinds and looked at them to see what was happening. At first, he was struck by the emptiness of the street. There were none of the usual morning commuters or the street vendors or even po uh, police patrols. The wind picked up leaves and a sort of garbage blew them unhindered down the street. Confused but not perturbed, Yamauchi sat down once again. After a short while, attempting to return to his work, Yamauchi took another glance of his scene below. There were now men present, all aligned in matching khaki uniforms with weapons strapped to their sides. They stood in formation alert. Not wanting to meet their eyes, he pulled back the blinds and sat down, and settled by what he had seen. He clocked off early and took, a, took what remained home. A work remained home. It was mine ablaze, he could only wonder what had been fallen the state. There will be time to catch up with work tomorrow. Chief Executive, I've been waiting to see you. There's enough snag that's come up. Something that I think we all talk about are snags. Come on, Kate and Shiro Marbert as he took his fam familiar scene in Takashima's office. Breathing in the smoke and blinking in the haze he'd grown accustomed to? Yes, well, Tokyo's gotten themselves all twisted in knots about some of your corporate uh, compatriots. There's no room for Japanese firms to compete in the Guangdong market now that the five corporations have gone so entrenched. I can't stop corporations from making. Uh, Money, Constantine, no, I don't know why you expect me to. Of course I understand, Takashima rubbed his brow, snuffing out a cigarette, but it's their complaint all the same. They want you to pay the corporation to make some space for them. Komaki and Ichiro stared incredulously across the table. You can't be serious. You want me to pay my peers to allow competitors into the market? How would you tell the Japanese firms that they've gotten the whole rest of Asia to sell to? Chief Executive, surely you of all people understand how profit-driven these corporations get. The Consul General sighed, adjusting his glasses. It's your call, but if you don't give them this, I wouldn't count on their investments coming back anytime soon. Fine. 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 Let me be clear. That includes our meeting. Uh, oh, I think I've read this before. Basically, just a different uh, ex chief executive. So, um, if you want to read this one, please go ahead. Whee! Teeth and hate, but profits, my friends. Profits. That's what we want. Surplus. Not great. Could be better. But still, the profits. Make sure they approve of this. Uh, we get 5% approval, which would destroy this, so there you go. Three more seats. Increases Zushin and Japanese expat support. We're at $35 billion, huh? Or up here? Nice. Nothing there. Which kind of sucks, but whatever. You start looking at reserves, that's nice. Teeth and eight. Nice. A little bit more poverty, but that's okay, you know. Let's, let's be expected. Beautiful, my friends. Nothing bad can happen here, right? 
with a reform bureaucracy. Rupo Kai Manchuha. Manchuha, yeah. Hey, the Saint's finally gone. Bardock cycle, huh? 85 days, we gotta keep some of this political power here. But I'll do that too, anyways, because since we don't have to spend anything here on the region of Guangdong, which is really nice. Enjoying this. Teeth and hate. A speech, a simple speech. Come on, the Council, Council General. Uh, Kane took a deep uh, sip of his piping hot coffee. It was an unusually cold day, and so far, while Kane re relished it. It was nice to finally be able to drink his coffee hot rather than warm. His hands rested a newspaper. He cracked into it, glancing every now and then over the Pearl River, watching it run, flow, and bend downstream. The paper was stopped by a massive picture of Komai Kenichiro, the chief executive, shaking hands with the Consul General. It seemed oddly shot to Kane, giving off an almost sinister feel. The idea of the camp by time and the executive working together was an extremely disturbing thought, especially for a man involved as deeply in the legislative council as Representative Kane was. Disregarding his thoughts, Kane read an extract of Komai's joint speech with the Consul General. The Japanese camp by representative in a republic have long been the vanguard of Pan Asianism and the inner Asian development. They served us both Japan and co-prosperity sphere reliably, efficiently, and loyally. Their honorable service and the issues currently affecting the nation has inspired me to ask for some additional aid. The Consul General has more to say on this issue. The Camp Pai Tai. The attachment in this republic is to be bumped up by 50% in an effort to fight against illegal militia organizations. Units from all over the co-prosperity sphere have been called in, and their abilities to fight the, against illegal paramilitary armies will be instrumental in defeating these organizations. The citizens of Guangdong should not have to fear foreign instigators any longer. Interesting. Neglect and abuse. Pretend to care. Ooh, get more stability though. Your problem, not ours. So they'll have no choice but to obey. Pretend to care, so they have no choice but to behave. We went right earlier, so I want to go right here too. Neglect and abuse. Tolerance, and the Achilles heel of many of a prosperous empire, the heinous termite hole and etched, and in the majestic monument of order and eroding its integrity from within. Tolerance is what permitted subversive elements to ravage our civilian and administrative sectors, and tolerance we shall begin no, give them no more. We'll formally declare dissident activity as criminal offense, informing our papas that only those loyal and cooperative to Hitachi deserve redemption and a chance at survival in a new state. So they have to obey the challengers. Oh. If you're gonna do this, please go ahead. We have 44 seats in total, which penalizes us. God dang it. Bruh. Bruh. Why do you hurt me so, bruh? Johnny don't like us, but whatever. A beautiful speech, huh? I want more stability, man. That'd be nice. Whatever. Who's leading America? Ah. Jumbo. David Sterling's over here, too. French State. Sidos. We saw this guy earlier. Salazar. Gorky is gorking it up. He's not even at war. He's gorking it up. Gurkis. How's Turkey doing? Is that Iraq and... Is that Kurdistan? Mosul and Kirkuk. Oh, come on. I'm actually really interested in, like, Iraq in the future. And even Turkey. I'm really interested in what happens with Turkey in the future. Maybe some, like, South American states. It would be kind of cool to see what the devs can whip up for those guys. Too much corruption. Everything will be fine. The safety of every man, woman, and child uh, will be guaranteed. Do not allow yourselves to be frightened by the forces of dissent. The harsh and unyielding voice of Kamai Kenichiro, the chief executive who had supposedly achieved so much for the nation, trailed on, the small portable radio trans transmitting the speech relayed his voice in a coherent yet grainy quality. Chiu Wang Kai revisited distant yet fond memories of diligently working under the sweltering heat of fluorescent lights as simply to earn a wage capable of sustaining his family. He glanced towards the radius, continued to emit the astronic speech, the ominous undertones becoming ever clearer word after word. I wish for stability and prosperity to return to this land, a land the speech was interrupted, by the deafening sound of crying emanating from Chiu's infant son. Chiu walked the short distance in his co in commodiously small apartment between his chair and the worn couch, where his wife was attempting to comfort the crying baby, desperate to be fed. He tried to force facial fe expressions that were amusing or humorous for the baby, which seemed to calm the baby down. There's a vociferous, vos, oh, vos, oh my god, vociferous noise of crying slowly subsided. The voice of Kumai once again filled the cramped apartment. The rhetoric had become more concerning. For men, for the men who encourage the proliferation or, or partake in the heinous deed of dissent, we will not allow you to avoid consequences, for your actions have damaged the great state greatly. The bit began to show signs of discontent once more, which were qu hastily quelled by the dissent. Disingenuous giggles at you, now more concerned than ever by the contents, contents of the blurring speech. Outside the confining space of the apartment, the same words were being listened to by the residents across the three paroles, an uneasy feeling of uncertainty continuously looming over their heads as the stern voice of the chief executive echoed through the streets and how was it going wrong? Your fears will be dutifully answered. 
City prisoners. Fingers on your throat. That's where I like to put my hands. The issue of the omnipresent dissidents and agitators continues to plague us, and an abhorrent malaise that extended its vile tentacles around the once pristine Pearl of Guangdong. These dissidents threaten the security of the state and must be exterminated. The objects and institutions of Guangdong that naturally benefit the forces of opposition, like the press and the fruitless publications, will certainly place the state in great peril. The independent publishers and their hazardous literature only serve as a mouthpiece for the spread of the dissident agenda, and as such must not be, must not be tolerated. Well, demand that the press is halt, any futile semblance of resistance will be met with our security forces and the crackle of gunfire. We must not allow the ideologies of the enemy to be exported to our populace and in turn allow the desecration of the shining pearls. Absolutely not. Oh, and there goes the Reichstadt. Goodbye, Reichstadt. Goodbye. And good riddance. Oh, no, no. I don't want to lose profits. No. No. Profits, me boy. No, no. South, Southeast Asia is going to be kind of a. Everything's going to be wild when the deaths get to the. Nice. Didn't help that much. But it's better than nothing, I guess. Managing the flood, Lamp found it difficult to count them, in part because there were so many, but he did anyways, making sure not to miss a single one, fifteen of them in total, bearing an age and weight and demeanor, but here all because they were accused of subversive activity against the government. Regardless, a problem presented itself. Lamb petered into the cell. Most of them didn't have any space to move around at all, and the police officer knew that more were coming in later that evening. He turned to superior jab and his lieutenant. My assessment is that we didn't have enough room for the one more, let alone twenty, east is sitting over. What should we do then, sir? The Japanese man pondered the question for a moment, then replied, Well, I like nothing more than to move them all to a prison facility, but that's not possible. The entire jail system is overcrowded, there are just too many dissidents in this darn place. They stood there in silence, all of them, Lamb, Lieutenant, and prisoners. Lamb glanced at the prisoners, who stared back at him warily. The officer opened his mouth to speak, but the lieutenant broke the stillness first. There's a solution to this, however. If our friends, he said, gesturing to the group, pledge to cooperate with Hitachi and become our informants, then we'll send them free. Few ever take up on this offer, though. Officer Hayashi, you know them well. Why is that? Because nobody in the right mind would worth work with this vile regime, Lamb thought, because the wickedness of this government is obvious. But of course he couldn't say that, so Lamb bit his tongue and main maintained a neutral expression and muttered a decidedly non-committal response. I have no idea, sir. I guess it's as good as mine. Uh, read this one right now. Uh, adrenal Center Fear. With the extensive expansion of our security forces and increased enforcement of policies on the streets, the safety of Guangdong's virtuous citizenry expands ever more. Seditious individuals, once prevalent and commonplace in the streets and alleyways, are no longer seen. Through the presence of our security forces and infallibility of the rubber baton, the glorious and radiant luster of the pearls of Guangdong and once again begin to reemerge. It's better evident of progress. Much of our population remains apprehensive, their heads fill with irrational anxieties and concerns. However, their fear is only a beneficial sign that demonstrates the extent of our reach across the state. A clear symbol of the inevitable success of our regime's valiant efforts to exterminate dissent. Huh, part 9. If you want to do this, please go ahead. But I think we will end it there. So if you enjoyed this, the first video of us playing as Hitachi Limited. Thanks, uh, thanks for watching. First of all, leave a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see what else we can do to make Guangdong extremely prosperous. And financially. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.